Hey there, so I am making a video because I have an unboxing to do. In actuality, this video is, you know what, it's sponsored by Dawes. So if you are here <clears throat> on a regular basis, then uh, I guess I should let people know that I'm here because this one was one of those like quick uh, surprise videos that I did not intend to do. But uh, there's one thing that I, that I will always do, that I, that I do promise, is that any time that somebody... Hey Danuch, welcome. Whenever somebody sends me something here in a video, then that I will, um, I will unbox that video. <laughs> hey, hey Neda. And uh, I will make sure that that video, hey JR, is, is dedicated and considered sponsored by the person that sends it. So, got, my, got, a, got a package today. And uh, I kind of got it cut, but I haven't t taken it out yet. Even though I, I do know what it is, because he did tell me. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's go on. Uh, let's let's let the Instagram, Twitter people know that we're here, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. You ready to break that wall? Hey there again. So we are about to do an unboxing, courtesy of Daz, and it should be a really fun one. We'll talk about uh, the arrow sale. We'll, maybe we'll dive into some Criterion. And I'll have some uh, some other ideas as well. Hey, Dick, Dick Tana. <clears throat> Let's do the same thing on Instagram, and then we're well, then we're good. And then we'll do the unboxing. Hey, Wheels. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, actually, I was able to upgrade my phone finally. Uh, and uh, this the eleven was what I could get for free, <laughs> so, so that was good. Hi there, Fry. We're checking connection, apparently. We're still checking connection. And it did not go through. But I'm now live. All right. Hey there on Instagram land. I am now getting ready to do an unboxing. We're going to talk about Arrow. We're going to talk about Criterion. We're going to talk about the company that is in this bag. Yeah, I'm an iPhone guy, too. I know a lot of people like it, more techie people, uh, more techie than me, anyway. Uh, aren't as much or like a lot of younger people like Android because of stuff they can do with it. I'm uh, I'm kind of different than that because I, because uh, at, at, in my home, hey Daz, dude, this is your video, man. <clears throat> this is the video that you sponsored. So guys, you can thank Daz for this video because I was not going to make a video tonight. Uh, but uh, I am now and we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff, but first, I cut this here so it make it easier to do, and we're gonna do the unboxing. You guys ready? This is something I'm actually really excited about. Um, I had a bunch of things put on an Amazon wish list, and Dawes just happened to pick one of the top things. <laughs> hey, Adrian, that I uh, that I was uh, that I wanted on this list, and that helps kind of me uh, fill a. Uh, a big gap in my uh, in my collection, and I love it. <clears throat> and this is Perversion Story by by Lucio Fulci. Hey, boredom, and thank you so much, Daz. Uh, what you may not know is that I I've although I've seen this film a long time ago, I've never owned it, and it's uh, always been big on my list because recently, especially over the Halloween month, I ended up getting Murder Rock and ended up getting a couple another Lucio Fulci film as well, The Psychic. Uh, seven notes in black, but this had, had always been one that had had I, I kept missing on. And this is by Mondo Macabre, who are a fantastic company who puts out a lot of great stuff. And this movie, I think, was originally titled "One on Top of the Other," uh, like is the other title for this film. It's been a long time, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Now, a lot of people remember Fulci for a lot of his later stuff, a lot of his like. Like the Beyond or uh, or Host by the Cemetery, uh, I am, and uh, I'm not sure if you knew this or not. I was a huge fan of his more. Uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, it's really good. Uh, of his more kind of like some of his more subdued or more serious works, uh, like uh, Don't Torture Duckling, or uh, you know, films like that. So this not only is a good one, <clears throat> not only is a good film, but it has some great features here as well. So. Uh, there's an HD transfer, of course. 
from the original negative, which is important. This is the full extended European version of the film. Um, interview with star Jean Sorel. Interview with star Elsa Martinelli. Interview with author Stephen Thrower, who's always really good with his interviews. Uh, English language choice, English Italian language choice. Original theatrical trailer, and it's always one of the great things is the Mon Macabre preview. And if anybody's ever had one Mon Macabre, uh, if you ever watched a Mon Macabre, like their preview thing that they do, it's like usually around five, six months long. And it's got that, like, hey, hey, Brian. It's got that kind of freaky Mon Macabre song music. And uh, by the time you're finished, uh, what, by the time you're finished, like the tr the uh, the preview, the Mon Macabre preview, you just like want all their movies. <laughs> so let's try. Let's open this up here. I'm actually extremely excited about this film since I'm a huge Fulci fan, and as I've said on here, like on many many occasions, when you're collecting. And a lot of collectors are like this. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure who here is like this, like me. But you can have like a room full of stuff. Uh, okay, Ricardo. I haven't seen that one in ages, man. <clears throat> but it's always the stuff that's not there that you're missing. That's glaringly obvious in your collections. If you're especially if you're OCD like me, that uh, that stand out. And not having perversion story stood out. So, there you go. As you can see, it is a region-free film. So it doesn't matter what region you're from. Like movies, well, this is one of my favorite directors. <clears throat> I had this on my Christmas wish list, actually. Because um, I actually took my... <laughs> Here we are. I took my... I took uh, like part of what my wish list was and I put it onto, uh, onto there. Hey, jo hey, Jose, welcome. <clears throat> so, I am super stoked about seeing this one. I'm probably going to watch this the weekend. So, this is before Lizard and... Uh, I've got it PVRing. Although I'm not happy with Chris Jericho right now. Uh, this was before Lizard and a Woman's Skin. Uh, but I'll... Uh, hey, Kathy. So it'll be interesting to see, like, the progression. I like to eventually sit down, like, spend, like, a, a weekend or a week, some, when I get some time off, and uh, just, like, watch Fulci's uh, as Extremely Cool Does. Thank you uh, so much, dude. Uh, watch through Fulci's films, like, his, uh, his, his basically his, uh, his Jallo films in, um, in progressive order, in chronological order, and see how the... Uh, how they change and you know how they go and twist around the way. I didn't do it. I missed out on that. It's, it, at the time that it came, I just couldn't afford to uh, to get any to get anything. But that being said, there are a couple sales that are going on right now. Well, hopefully I'll keep up the. <clears throat> Don't worry, they always put it a standard edition as well. We may miss out on the extra stuff, uh, but the discs themselves should be identical. So that'll, that'll be good that way. I'm okay as long as I get the film. Uh, even if I miss out on the special edition, there's the standard edition, I'll get that. Uh, because with Mind Macabre, the standard edition really is like a reversible cover and a booklet, uh, usually, and sometimes cards, I think. Uh, but uh, as long as none of the features are missing, as long as I'm not like, missing the film. Uh, the reason I tend to grab some of the Arrow or Screen Fact releases, like uh, quickly, is uh, is because sometimes the features go off some of those things, especially Arrow. Uh, they'll have an extra disc or something like that. Yep, the, not only they do my Bloody Valentine does, but it is glorious looking. Uh, a lot of times people complain about uh, Screen Factory's covers, but this is one of the times. That I I cannot deny it, but uh, man, did they get it right. And this is the cover, guys, to My Bloody Valentine. This is the new cover. Ooh, 
which I'm not sure about anybody else, but I find it like super gorgeous. And just so you know, it has, rather than have like the information on the other side, it has artwork on both sides of the, of the, of the slip cover. So there are both sides of the slip cover for you. And I think if you buy the limited edition from them, uh, they also, uh, you also get, I think there's a, or you get the art, right? Yeah, they're putting the house to Jack built. Uh, and also they're putting in another one as well. They just mentioned it uh, recently. There is a reverse. Oh no, yeah, the reverse will probably be the, uh, <laughs> Do you want to talk about the Pet Cemetery 2 art? Did anybody see the Pet Cemetery 2 art for uh, from Scream Factory? Because it got a lot of hate. I would love a Harry Ward NECA figure. So this, this is Pet Cemetery 2. Now this is the second one, dude. This one with, with uh, Clancy Brown. Uh, and it is, I like the art as, as art itself, but, uh, it doesn't really suit, uh, the Pet Cemetery uh, art. Cold War. Criterion's putting out some great stuff lately. Well, they put a great stuff anyway. But remember this. If you really like Pet Cemetery 2 and you want the film, this is probably going to have a ton of features. And artwork is reversible. So there you go. You can reverse part of the original art. Part of me wants them to do a Harry Warden figure. The other part of me doesn't because I know I, uh, that's, that's going to be something that's really going to tempt me. They put out a few NECA figures with their with their movies as previously, like the uh, the Solid Night, Daily Night ones. I I was sad not to get those. Like I didn't mind missing out on things like Night of the Demons, stuff like that. I was okay with that. Uh, Solid Night, Daily Night was one of my favorite movies, <clears throat> like of that type. Scream is playing April Fool's Day Danusha. I cannot wait. <clears throat> I'm uh, there's a lot of stuff to play recently that I'm excited about, and a lot of stuff that I have to get into. By the way. It's not just a Criterion sale uh, right now. I would love that. Uh, it's now the Arrow sale as well. So on Barnes & Noble, they're doing, they're doing their half their 50% off Criterion sale, and they're doing their 50% off Arrow video sale as well. Originally, what I planned to do was on Friday, I was going to make a video where I talked about my favorite, uh, like, my, like my top 10 picks for both sales, and I still might do that, actually. Uh, so I think that'd be an interesting, uh, interesting way to go with, with things. I no, I'm, I'm way behind on my uh, on my Criterion stuff. Seriously, I mean, like it should be. Uh, like most of their stuff is uh, is on sale. Let me go. I'll go to Barnes and Noble right now. I'll tell you. I believe. I hope. See, I am like super behind on that stuff. I so hate the uh, Parnes and Noble like uh, website f for finding stuff because it, it sucks. It uh, it really sucks. Like I'm trying to get to the sales. Oh my god. Okay. <clears throat> I 
I don't have the brute. I really need the brute, actually. It is a fantastic film. I really love the brute. Hey, Joseph. Haxan is a great one. Fellini, as much as I want a Fellini set, I would prefer to get a Kurosawa set first. Because that's the one that I feel has been dangled uh, more than anyone else. It doesn't feel like that is getting to that point now where there's so much coming out. There's such a proliferation of... Uh, <clears throat> Of movies that are uh, they're being put and movies that we wanted that now that was a DVD set <laughs> I think we need an upgrade from that older set and that was a limited set that not a lot of people got it almost seems like there's too much to nooch but uh that's why you, you got to pick and choose what you really want to watch uh, what the limited availability of that of what you're getting is because let's face it there's there's a lot of stuff that comes out uh but it seems like now oh that could be a good that'd be a reason uh but now it seems like with you know all these big like things well it's not just that Kubrick lever it's that it's that uh <clears throat> The, around this period, we exactly that's what it is. We, we don't know what's going into print anymore. Uh, we knew originally, like with stuff like Indicator or or certain or other companies, we knew like okay, this is a limited amount. It's limited to this, these many copies. Once these are gone, these are gone. And we grab those box sets and we grab those limited editions because we could wait on some of the other stuff uh, that we still may want equally. Uh, because you know it's going to be there but now with the recent announcements from Kino and Screen Factory that titles that we were unaware of that were go are going into print are going into print uh, now you have to look at it in a, uh, in a in another way you have to think okay not just okay what's limited but what can't I do without uh, So I'm, I've been going back towards Screen Factory now, and I've been looking at their stuff. And even you know they got their two lists out there. Uh, I, I will be very doubtful if that's the last list we're going to get of out of print stuff coming from Screen Factory. I think we're going to get another one. So, uh, I basically, I'm I'm looking at the, the Screen Factory library, and I'm thinking, okay, what's MGM? What, what year did this was did they release this movie? Is this possibly going to be another list? Because the problem with it is that sometimes when they drop their lists, uh, a lot of scalpers are uh, are around, and they grab up all the copies so that you, when you go to get them, uh, you go to Amazon, for instance, to get them, you you'll find that they've been increasing in, in price. That's what I, I think. Some some of them for that, like, but Fry, for some movies, I worry that with so many options out there, like, how long will we have to wait for another version of a story, especially if it's a niche movie that uh, that not everybody like, may want to pick up on? I have very low hopes <clears throat> that I'm going to get a madman in any other company in the near future all time dream releases uh, one of them's coming out I think scalpers I don't know if scalpers watch streams or not actually I think scalpers like look at forum sites like blu-ray.com and stuff like that and they're they're watching around those type places there may be some scalpers that actually I don't know run companies uh, just just putting that one out there I think we all know who I'm talking about without me mentioning. <clears throat> but it gets frustrating. There was like 
trick or treat. I would love to trick or treat. I can't even see that's but yet that's twenty dollars American, and I'm not gonna lie to you. Right now, with my better half out of town, and I did get a couple things actually recently, uh, which I will be unboxing on Friday, by the way. Uh, Now, was there anything aside from the... I, I like the look of the slip. But, uh... I can't, uh... But I, I, I'm okay. Not, you know, not having the slip. See, that, that's how you know that I'm not a scale person with tech. Because that Russ Meyer collection is is right there. <laughs> not online. I keep an eye out for it. I just can't afford it right now, Lord Fry. And my better half is iffy on, uh on eBay after a couple experiences that we had uh, about a year or so ago. We lost a bit of money. What titles are in the Rush Market? Do you want to know what's in the Rush Market? You, you guys want me to get the Rush Market collection? Are you sure this isn't just because you guys want to look at uh, the Rush Market collection a little bit closer? But... <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> the... Uh... The seven, I know I didn't got, I did not get the seven bundle yet. I want it. Uh, I want the seven bundle. This truly is one of the joys of my collection. I'm not, yeah, not even joking. It really is. Somebody asked me what some of the, the holy grails that I want. Uh, some of the nineties, sexploitation films like the Night Eye series and the Body Chemistry series. And some Cynthia Rothrock stuff, which seems like really kind of crazily mundane stuff. But uh, they're not on Blu-ray, and they don't have good representation. And I do think they need good representation. The only problem with anybody getting <coughs> a, a, a box set of Russ Meyer is the, uh, is the company, is the people behind it. The Russ Meyer estate are horrible to work with uh, extremely horrible to work with and they would rather go out and try and do kind of a their bare bones type of a, I gotta get the screen factor one first then I might get the one-on-one one uh, then they'll you know ones for exorbitant prices then they will work with any other company to actually get these movies put out so this is my Russ Meyer box sets for people that have not seen it before. And uh, there were two editions of this put out. This edition here has more as one more film than the original edition that came out. Obviously I can't, there's, Oh, the, uh, well, they did really stand in the Chris collection. I got it up there. I got it over there. It's actually gorgeous. So I, mean, I have to make sure I can actually show this. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the first two disc, the first disc has two films, and that is The Moral Mr. T's and uh, Even the Handyman. Then it's Wild Gals of the Naked West and Black Snake. Okay, this one I gotta cover up. You're up in the raw. Okay, so I'm not sure actually. The next one's really good, and that is Lorna and Mud Honey, and I actually really like these. Actually, there's one extra feature, uh, Danuch. It's a uh, an hour long uh, special that appeared at least one extra feature that appeared on actually ironically on a Canadian channel. Uh, but uh, we don't. Uh, we didn't get it on the Canadian edition, and it's one that I really like, so I get it. I think it's Inside Black Christmas. There's an Inside series. Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, which I guess is one of his most famous, last, least raunchy films. Mardo Psycho and Good Morning uh, and Goodbye. Mondo Topless. Got to cover up some of the stuff. One of my favorite ones is Cherry, Harry, and Raquel. And of course, uh, common law cabins. Oh, is she? So you know the stuff here at Ida, man. 
Uh, then there was the uh, one, I think the one, this one wasn't on the other set. It was Pandora Peaks and Finders Keepers, Lovers Weepers. And what I consider one of his very best personal films, the movie Vixen with uh, Erica Gavin. I really like Vixen. And Super Vixens, which is also really fun. Followed by Up, which is weird. But, uh, oh, Russ Meyer is not... That's not exa not really a sleazy type of director. His films are actually very innocent. Uh, some of his later ones have a little bit more raunchiness, but I wouldn't consider them like the sleazy types. And of course, there's Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. So that's 19 movies, in case you weren't you were counting, of a Russ Meyer. And a lot of these have featurettes, commentaries. Uh, it's got uh, the incredibly strange. There's a this is a booklet which I cannot open up and show you guys. Of course, yeah, he would definitely be considered tame, but he was considered tame really in his day too. You, a lot of stuff that he made like the nudie cuties and stuff like that, they were even tame back then. Uh, there's a reason he's got a certain style to him and a certain like uh, Joe de V. Um, there's a reason that uh, that Roger Ebert uh, liked Russ Meyer and worked for, and worked with him, and that uh, and it's not just because there were like amply cleavage girls in there. Where from a girl's door to her? It should be a lot of fun. I've never seen the uncut edition of that. No, no. There's a lot more to it than that, uh, <clears throat> Brian. <clears throat> hey, Mike, welcome. When uh, Myers uh, did a film, and there's a particular, like, beautiful innocence to the early stuff that he did, uh, especially. He did. Much like Tintel Brass liked his uh, the portion of the body that he, that he liked, and we all know what that is because it rhymes with Brass, and if you've seen any of his movies... It, it, there's like an odd comic bookishness to a lot of his films, and uh, there, and they get a bit more out there and a bit experimental. But there's also things to look at in like the writing of the films, in like the uh, some of the social commentary that that's directed within the films themselves, um, and uh, <clears throat> some of the other uh, and the way that the cinematography is done. Russ Meyer is actually a good filmmaker. Like you may not always like a lot of his films, or you may. Uh, you may find him a little, either you find him a little bit too tame, or, or they may not be your taste. But he's always one of those people that's always been uh, a really good filmmaker. Vixen is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Vixen, I think, is one of the first I saw, and it has, holds a special place in my heart. Uh, was Colleen Brennan in it too? I don't know if he makes them look like goddesses or. Uh, because obviously he chooses women that are uh, that are often like you know amply endowed type thing, um, and I find it interesting that uh, we mentioned that. It was, well, yeah, it, it kind of in, in a way. Yeah, he does actually, uh, and and not in a way that I would find. Uh, I guess you know, exploitative, but not in the way. Uh, in a way, in much, in many cases, where they're the ones that that are in control, and that the women in Russ Myers films, you know, in, in my in my opinion, um, are different than like women in a lot of exploitation type films, and the reason for that is the women know. The women in these films often know their power, and uh, they're the ones that are able to like use use it to their advantage. Um, to a kind of like a, I want to say the right terminology. Do you know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> they have a strength. There's definitely an undercurrent of sexuality even in the most tame ones, but. As it goes through, you can tell that 
They, they have a certain strength to them. Uh, and I think that uh, we, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, that, you met, that, some, that we mentioned t Tinto Brass because he's much the same in the fact that uh, Tinto Brass <laughs> uh, would, uh, w would try to put a... It seemed to me, like from a lot of his films, um, and I haven't seen everything that he did, what would kind of put a, well, Tino Brass would go for erotic, but Tino Brass was a, a forefront, like in the women's sexual movement, sexual revolution, um, much in the way, like, like the Emmanuel, you know, series, kind of brought that out. Uh, this is an odd, this is not the topic that I thought it was going, going on. This is one of the great things about doing a lot of videos. You never know where you're going to go. Uh, life's like a box of chocolates. Uh, <clears throat> in that uh, both of these men that are known for, you know, for having like a, like beautiful women in their films and uniquely unusual films uh, actually uh, in my opinion anyway and you know anybody can feel free to debate it uh, I don't mind um, c give them a power uh, that uh, that a lot of filmmakers in that time period were, weren't doing uh, they're worth checking out Daz I mean they really are uh, like I can give you like some examples like some good like Vixen witchcraft <laughs> witchcraft is just <laughs> sleazy exploitation but I do like <laughs> those films because uh, the acting is so horribly bad it, it you, you've got to watch them uh, <laughs> that's what you're talking about the witchcraft films the ones with uh, <laughs> with what's his face uh, what's his name like for the first of them I love those movies, actually. I would love to see, like, uh, Vinegar Syndrome put them out. Dagger and Paul Fire and Come Drink With Me. Masef Shaz. I, uh, 80 films, but uh, didn't they announce some other stuff, some Italian ones as well? Sort of did. No, it's okay. That's never a problem. Faster Puss Cat, Kill Kill. Yeah, would actually make a great intro. Antonio and Bergman. If you're the women like women actually see things, then, then how men think they... That's a good point, actually. I actually think that uh, Tintal Brass tends to does that in a few of his films as well. He kind of like Funhouse mirrors it, and there are portions of it that I uh, that are like definitely in Tintal Brass films. Well, his basically his 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 imagination of what he thinks women are hey PlayStation of what he thinks women are uh, are like and another part is uh, exactly warlock uh, is about like what is, is done from the woman's side of it as well Tunnel Brass does that a bit uh, there's one called What's it called? It's one of my favorites, actually. It's I can't. It's just killing me. Anybody know some Tino Brass movies? Basically, it's a, it's about a woman who uh, has a a, a by a friend, a lover, a husband, whatever, and uh, I think it's called All Ladies Do It. And basically, they they have this game where she explains to him. Uh, like things that that happened to her or like may or may not have really happened to her uh, and he gets very excited but there's a cutoff point at a at a party something does happen and he gets very upset about it because when she's telling him stories from her past uh, that may or may not be true he can compartmentalize those those stories as something that a fan that happened that may or may not have happened to a fantasy woman and not the woman that he's with, but when something actually happens uh, at a uh, at a party, he gets very upset with her, and uh, and pretty much like leaves because he can't. Although it's the same thing, he can't you can't separate the uh, now now fantasy and reality have mixed and he can't separate those two. At least that's the way that I took the film, and it goes on from there. But that's like the uh, near the beginning of the film. 
<laughs> a bit of a pervy film. A bit, but it is a bit of, like, like a Warlock said, it is a bit of Awakening. Our new films always have They did in the 80s, too, I mean, like Ragman. Uh, and I've been watching, like, a bit of... I've been off, like, you know, took, took a couple of days off. Uh, and I've been watching a lot of Cisco Niebert recently. And uh, with their early stuff, like back in the, when their sneak previous days. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, and I can't, I love the Friday 13th films. And I love slasher movies and stuff like that. And they venomously hate the Friday 13th films. But by the time they get to, to part four, uh, the final chapter, like they hate them, but... Cisco gets it. He says, you know, because Roger Ebert is like talking about the fact that okay, these are horrible and these are misogynistic <clears throat> and they're like like a horrible influence on, on kids and they're and it's just downbeat and depressing and it's a horrible worldview. And Cisco says, well, you're kind of taking that a little bit too far. Um, in actuality, um, he said, you know, when kids go to watch these movies, you know, they're not good movies. He said, but they're roller. It's like going on a roller coaster. And uh, rather than like the ups and downs on a roller coaster, uh, that's the uh, that you know that's their uh, that's 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 the cinematic equa equa equation of that. Uh, <clears throat> and he's not wrong, nor is he wrong about the fact that I will be honest. Uh, yes, they're not the best made movies in the world. I just happen to uh, to like them. Cisco and Ebert were progressive, uh, like ahead of their time when it came to progression, and uh, they were very strong. Like, if there was any, if there were two guys that I that I ever say were were probably uh, I don't know if we use the word feminist or or kind of just like ahead, like thinking ahead when it came to came to that type of stuff, who, who would have been very comfortable in uh, right now, uh, Cisco and Ebert would be those would be those people. But they had the ability to not, you know, to be like a, to still give you an analysis. So they may hate the movie, I may like the movie, but their analysis of the films and their thoughts on, on, the, on filmmaking in general, by far and large, was, was correct. Where the you know, I love the Friday Thirteenth films. They're my they're one of my favorite franchises. Are they well? Are they overall well made films? Uh, no, not probably not. <laughs> that that's the truth. And a lot of the movies I like aren't extremely well made in in like in a cinematic way. And uh, and that's that's the truth of the matter. Uh, but does that make them any less enjoying, or enjoyable, or entertaining for me? Not at all. Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, I'm sure like. A lot of people, oh yeah, and, and Starman. Like, I'm one of the like longtime proponents of Starman, um, and they were on board when other critics were like not so big on Star. They were big on Starman. They love Starman, uh, <clears throat> and I still think that's one of John Carpenter's most underrated films. That uh, and it's got and you know, Scream Factory did put it out. I don't I don't have it in my collection, yet, which is amazing. Um, because it was so good. And even the TV show was, was good as well. I like the TV show with Robert Hayes too. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, they, these were people that, that knew their stuff. Uh, they, they weren't just people, like nowadays anybody, me in, included, right? I can go online and I can say, well, this is my thoughts and, I, and my opinions. On uh, is it are you serious? On on films, but unlike a lot of critics out there, uh, Cisco and Ebert could back it up. Uh, Cisco at the time when they started out, for instance, uh, Cisco and Ebert, Cisco Gene Cisco was was the younger of the two. Unfortunately, he was one that passed first. Uh, but he was younger. He like he was like I think it was Harvard or Yale, uh, educated, and he was like uh like um, he was a huge movie connoisseur. And Roger Ebert had been like had, had you know had, had been like studying film, and had been uh, friends with people like Russ Meyer, for instance. 
Um, I don't know if I'll ever be as good as either one of them. Here's the thing. Gene Sisko said one thing, and, uh, and, it was, and it was extremely correct. Gene Sisko was the better reviewer. Roger Ebert was a better writer. Roger Ebert was a really good writer. If you ever read his, his books, his reviews, whether you agree with his opinions or not, they're extremely well written. Um, but I'm, I miss that. I'm a, we have reviewers online now, and uh, a lot of them, a lot of people that grew up watching uh, Sisko and Ebert, uh, like me, I would be so, when I was a kid, I'd be so peeved when they would like, when the latest slasher film would come out, dead kid films, they called them. And uh, I knew that I'd be angry because they were going to hate them. I knew that. Uh, and I was a, a young guy, then. and these were my films, right? Uh, these guys were attacking my films, but still I, I had to watch them. And, and I knew Aroma, the, uh, the educated skunk, was going to come out uh, eventually because uh, that the, there was a, they had a, a mascot in the early days called Aroma, the educated skunk. I'm not joking. They were, they, before it became the best, like the worst of the year, they had like the, the stinkers of like whatever year it was in the early days of a Cisco neighbor. Trust me, go back and watch them again. They're really fun to watch. <laughs> but one of the most exciting things about, about them both, and I noticed this on a few films, even on films they didn't like, uh, but they almost liked, is that you could tell their love for film because they're always talking about the fact that, uh, that, he, uh, that you know, if they could have only gone back and edited it just a little bit more or fixed it there. I thought they were hypocrites, really? How come? Hebrew was. He did write Valley of the Dolls, but I don't think that makes him a makes him a hypocrite. Uh, because a lot of the films that Ebert liked were on the would be considered a, a bit of the trashier side. And I always give them a break on the fact that these are people that whose lives were are were reviewing films. So they were in the theater all the time. So whereas it was more of a, a novel thing, if you to go out and watch a Friday Thirteen film or go watch My Bloody Valentine, hey William, welcome, or something like that. Uh, a lot of us are watched it to enjoy it, and we just have fun. However. If you're reviewing movies on a regular basis and you're reviewing them with a certain like criterion standard, uh, and remember, as I say, this slasher is one of my favorite genres. Uh, it gets, I'm sure for them, it got maddeningly repetitive, pretty fast. I mean, by the time '83 came around, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it must have gotten pretty uh, repetitive. And yeah, a lot of films, probably slasher films, that were better and that they probably would have liked. You know, if they really had opened up and given self, self a chance to like some of them, where their views were skewed by the fact that they were watching so many of these that at a certain point in time, I feel like they checked out. Uh, like they really didn't like this genre, so they checked out and often didn't give a chance. But later on, I think that they, that they did actually. Exactly. You, like, it doesn't matter what a critic says. It matters what you like. I like a lot of movies, obviously, that a lot of people don't like. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy uh, a critical review or analysis of a film. I uh, Sometimes I can sit down and I can watch a movie and I can enjoy it just for the film it is. And sometimes... I, I am in, in critical mode, which I don't do on this uh, on this channel. Um, not very often anyway. I just give like I, I try. I don't know if you notice or not, but I don't I don't try to go too in depth. I, I try to give a base review of a film, and often uh, it's short and concise. And the reason for that is because I want to. Uh, I, I went in the way of like having conversations about films. Because I want people to be able to to, to explore it themselves, and give their own opinions on it. <laughs> I wish. If, if now, if Vinegar Cinema wants to give me some money, I will like come on here and I will like 
be like Scrooge McDuck and that was a horrible Scrooge McDuck by the way and just be uh The one thing that I did like the crit that Cisco Neighbor did was they got really intense about the uh, the dead kid thing, to uh, to the point where they gave out people's addresses from Friday the Thirteenth. I'm not joking; they did this. Uh, now, that being said, I do think that much like the way things are done today, Cisco Neighbor's complete trashing of the uh, of some of the earlier films brought them a lot of publicity. And I don't know exactly how. I know they really didn't like the phones, but I don't. But I'm sure at points they did play it up as well. No, no, critics are very different from trolls. Uh, and the the reason being, in, in, in my opinion, is that a troll. Uh, Troll offers nothing um, to a conversation. But a reviewer, whether you agree with a lot of the reviewers or not, uh, they, they do give a critical analysis based on certain criteria uh, that you may or may not agree with. And the one good thing that has come out of like the internet and YouTube and stuff like that is now, sometimes Kathy and sometimes not. It really depends. I, 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 I go back and forth on it. Uh, I try to go in blind if I can. Now we're getting critics for different types of films. Cisco and were mainstream critics for, for movies across the board. Uh, Exactly, and that Roger Ebert was one of those people that could do that, uh, because I don't like the movie spoiled for me, and I find that a lot of modern day trailers, and even like some of the older trailers, give away too much of the film, and uh, it's a Superman three thing, where uh, they give the give or any DC film actually, <laughs> they give away too much in the trailers. Uh, can you imagine not knowing half the stuff that DC gives away in their trailers? Like uh, how much more exciting those films would be. Even if, you know, Us was fantastic in my opinion. Uh, but, but that's the thing. And I, I think we get too uh, caught up in uh, this person likes this or this person doesn't like this or this company puts this out so there must be money behind it. Uh, marketing. There's money behind every film. Uh, are there... Are there reviews that are bought and sold? No, not more than there was in, in the past. Uh, now I'm sure there's more shill like people that'll that want that that I'm sure will go in like and just like everything. But uh, but that's the you know that's a different thing. Trailer collections, however, Warlock I, I adore. Often though, Kathy, sometimes the trailers can be deceiving and not give you like the real like grasp of the film Colin Farrell as a I, as a penguin I can get behind I'm kind of I'm iffy on Andy Serkis as a uh, as Alfred I, I, I'm not seeing it yeah everybody influences everybody when it comes to this and that, that's a good you guys influence me in in some of my my movie choices on on a regular basis you guys know that right um, that's the whole concept behind this is uh is open each other's eyes. What's the best trailer collection? I don't know, but I do think that uh, that you need to have the two uh, uh, video nasties documentaries that have trailer collections on them. Uh, those two are, are utterly fantastic. I don't have any of the trailer trauma ones. Uh, I've never been able to get them around here. I know they had them on sale for a while. That information goes back and forth. <laughs> A drive-in de delirium is something I've really been looking at. I've, I've been eyeing them up for a long time. Umbrella Entertainment put those out, and the one the covers are gorgeous and they look fantastic. They're, and they're broken up the, into decades as well. 
I remember one of the f first early ones I got was, uh, was it Optimum or something like that? It was a company from England that put out these, uh, these trailer tapes. And I got the, the first one. It's got this, like, this head with this kind of bite into a hand. For like me, I can't remember the name of it is. But it had a uh, Emily Booth, I think. Was it Emily Booth? Is Emily Booth a, uh, a like a British, uh, like horror like person? Or am I thinking of somebody else? I'm probably thinking of somebody else. Anyway, so she was on, wherever, wherever she was, she was on the, uh, like, did, did kind of a commentary thing on that trailer tape. Oh, they, if you like the Kung Fu stuff, a fistful of Kung Fu trailers, but like parts one and part two are really good. I do plan to do one, Danucci. I, I was supposed to do one months ago, like literally months ago, with Jace, who is my Australian friend here. We did a James Bond uh, like uh, live stream together, and he was very, very like well spoken, and he knew way more than I did. Uh, and we're supposed to do like a uh, a Western one, and that didn't happen yet, purely and totally because of me and my lagging and dragging on things because life unfortunately got got in the way but i do plan to do something on uh, on westerns in the near future uh, hopefully if jace is still around we'll get to do that he probably went on and did that with someone else and i wouldn't blame him and uh if he ever watches this video jace i'm sorry uh eventually if you still want to do one of these days we can actually do it I try and I mean to, and I've been asked to do collaboration videos in like in the uh, in the past. And oh, <laughs> said, Diane, have a great evening, dude. Uh, and I try to do some when I can, uh, but I, I'll, 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 I'll be honest. I got I got burnt a couple times, uh, and that's made me more more gun shy. Uh, so yeah, things things have things happened to me before on uh, on YouTube that uh that almost made me want to go. So that's why that's sometimes takes me a while. I think the Mill Creek ones are worth checking out. Uh, like even like you know the good quality, bad quality, uh, you know medium quality. At least you you get a a bunch of them. And you get to see a lot of good good films that you probably wouldn't see, like Massacre Time, I'm sure, is on there, which is a fantastic film, by the way. Um, God's Gun, there's so many. Am I missing your comment skin? Oh, you talked to Jace. Well, tell him I'm sorry, and I, and I still want to do it in the future. Mill Creek has done a lot of really good stuff. Mill Creek started out much like... Uh, like other companies, like Echo Bridge, man, they're still not there yet. But <laughs> but Mill Creek uh, started doing it. It's just like a company that was pretty much getting doing like public domain, uh, public access, access stuff. That is true, Warlock. But uh, they they came a, a long ways because what happened was a lot of companies, like just they weren't you know they weren't putting out a lot of their own stuff anymore. Uh, they were looking at like streaming stuff or licensing stuff out. Uh, companies got lazy. So there was companies like Mill Creek that were ready to like, you know, buy up like licensing rights for certain films and just grab as many as they could. And that's why you're seeing so many like big TV shows that come out from Mill Creek now. I was asked recently if I was going to do a, a problem like episode, uh, an episode on like Italian, like, muscle men like Hercules, um, Samson type of films. And I definitely am going to be doing one of those in the near future, especially with so many uh, coming out. I like VCI though. I mean like VCI put out a lot of really good stuff. And I wouldn't want them to, to go, I wouldn't want them to go under like VCI. Uh, now, BCI's acquisition guy was Cliff McMillan from Screen Factory, actually. He was one of the big acquisition guys for, uh, <laughs> uh, I knew you'd say that, Kathy. Obviously, that's why you, you like my videos, Kathy, because of my <laughs> Steve Reeves-like physique. Uh, that, that's obviously it. And if that didn't make you laugh. Uh, but, Casa uh, <laughs> Rose is fantastic, actually. I do love that one. 
They did, and it, and it was such a shame because they were putting with such great stuff. Like you can look back, and if you're lucky enough to grab some of that BCI stuff now, uh, and and you know you get it, and you'll be putting in something. Uh, oh, the, oh, no, <laughs> do I have to get either one of those? <laughs> Uh, I'll go with the Arnold one, I guess. Uh, although the Disney one's fun, like, it's, it's fun. It's Tate Donovan, right? I think Tate Donovan's the voice of, of Hercules in the, uh, in that one. But if I'm gonna go with Disney, if I'm gonna go with Hercules, I want like a Steve Reeves or someone like that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you can find BC, some of BCI's early stuff, like, uh, and Mill Creek did like re-release some of the stuff. But when BCI put a lot of it originally, like those driving classics and stuff like that. Some of those had like hidden features and hidden commentaries and stuff on there uh, that uh, that weren't advertised on any of the discs. But you'd put it in and you just look. There's like second audio, and all of a sudden you're listening to a commentary on on a current international picture that you didn't know existed. Uh, that that I think is incredible. I wish I had more BCI stuff, and I always look out for their stuff. If I go to a flea market or a yard sale and I see anything with BCI's name on it. Uh, I automatically pick it up and I and I grab it and then I'll check later on and see if I if I own it or not. I so far I have haven't come across any that I already own. So uh, but uh, but I'll, I just grab them because I. Oops, excuse me. The Sons of Hercules. Oh, who's in that one again? The kid where the red fern grows. Public pictures. Oh, there are so many great companies, but we're in a what I think is going to be a golden age. Be considered when we look back on it, and a goal as a golden age of collecting. I uh, I truly think that right now is a golden age for a collector. There may have been more physical media in WalMarts and Targets and stores like that five or seven whatever years ago. Uh, but the access to the type of films that collectors actually do want and the work being put into it uh, at this point, it, it, it is unprecedented. Could you have imagined, like, even five years ago? I do, but I, I, the one thing, my problem with him is I'm, is I'm lazy and I don't scan everything in. <laughs> but uh, I have to rescan stuff, and I got over five thousand movies there. <clears throat> but uh, the thing is that uh, would you ever thought like Hills of Ice two would have a special collector's edition, uh, or or like a lot of those films? I mean, like did did you ever think that Bloodbath from Air, you know, which would would ever be a movie that was a must own film because you needed that special edition from Arrow. You wouldn't. I mean, it wouldn't be one of those ones you're like, yeah, oh, that's a good, that's a cool Corman film. I'm sure I'll get that in one of those like $5 bins, like for for cheap by some no name company. Uh, but now these movies are being put up by actual companies and uh, and being given like the, the red carpet treatment. Tam and the T Rex. What if that Tam and the T Rex would be coming out? Uh, like uncut with a 4K release. Not me, that's for sure. <laughs> Eastern, Eastern horror. Oh, there's so much good stuff. I mean, re there really is. I had a couple of those Eastern horror sets. I don't know if I got them now. They had like two movies on them, right? The the one you're thinking about, the Nooch. My favorite era. I, I'm 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 gonna be honest, Ragman, and, and and it's gonna be be pretty like. Uh, I grew. I'm an '80s kid. Uh, that was the most influential time for me. Uh, so, uh, although I love movie, I love movies from every decade and every era. And my favorite movies from 1974, uh, the '80s. It's my it's my favorite. But that being said, I watch. I'm beginning to watch more movies from different eras. Oh, I am definitely a Tyler's kid mug, because I ain't growing up. A steelbook of a uh, where from London? Nice.
Up the, did you, you got up the academy? Dude, that, that is sweet. I love that film. For people that don't know, uh, Up the Academy was a movie that was put out by Mad Magazine and uh, it was actually really good. And I think it was an early appearance, if I'm correct, by Stephen Jeffries, who of course would do Fraternity Vacation. And I guess most famous uh, was, uh, was Fright Night, where he was Evil Ed. I'm, I'm pretty, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Stephen Jeffries had a part in, uh, in Up the Academy. It, it, was, it was a favorite of mine. And it was a, a one that, as a, as a teenager, I found myself renting. Get Barbara back, exactly. Over and over again. I never, you got to see it in theater. I, I did not get to see it in theater. I wish I had. Cartoon All Stars. I would love to see that too. I love hot dogs too much. <laughs> I'm a hot dog. Yep, that is. Uh, Bar Barnes & Noble are, uh, are doing an arrow sale, just like last year. They started last year, and, pe and people were wondering, wasn't that cutting into, like, different, like, to the other sale, to the Criterion sale? But not really. I mean, like, for a lot of this stuff, like, sometimes you got a crossover appeal, for cer but certain people, you know, there's certain arrow group and certain Criterion group. Sometimes they mix, sometimes they don't. Yeah, I wonder if it's the one that I got, uh, Kathy. Uh, I got one over there, and I, my uh, I got it from my, my better half's a really big fan of sword and sandal films. Um, I think the ladies like the the muscular guys in the sword and sandal films. Um, so opposite of me, <laughs> if if this was a sword and sandal film, I would be the Aeolus guy on the side of the big Hercules guy. That's that <laughs> that's me. And in real life, when I was going to high school, pretty much the same thing. My friend was like six foot something and like buff. And I was the scrawny scarecrow guy. And I was surpri I'm surprisingly good with that, actually. I, you got you know your stuff with BCI, don't you? <laughs> Doing Johnson Hercules, yeah. I still say one of the most comical things ever is just before the Hercules movie came out, there's one of those, I guess, mockbusters. Like I'm I'm like five eight and a half. I'm only short. <laughs> um If I look taller on camera, fantastic, but I'm not. <laughs> but yeah, so oh, I lost my train of thought there. So basically my better half was excited to watch like uh, <laughs> the Hercules film. And she saw one come on. Was on Netflix or something like that, I think. So she saw one come on. She says, oh, I gotta watch this. This must be the rock one. I can't believe it's out already. So she turns it on, and there's this like scrawnier dude. And she's like, Okay, I guess that's what Hercules is gonna be like before he becomes a rock. Like, you know, sometimes they'll show like the younger guy, and then he grows up, and he's like the bigger buffer type of dude, like a milk commercial from the 80s. Uh, I'm dating myself for saying that reference. But she goes through the entire movie, like, said, when's it going to become The Rock? When's it become The Rock? But it was just, it was a mockbuster one with, like, a smaller guy playing Hercules. And it was over halfway through the film before she realized it was not the film she was going to, that she thought it was. But she kept watching it anyway because she was dedicated by that point. I never let her live that down, by the way. Mill Creek did start with that. But I think the, the thing that, that's kind of saved Mill Creek <laughs> is that uh, they, unlike BCI, that, uh, <laughs> is that a dagger I see before? Uh, unlike a, Mill Creek branched out in a different way. And they got like some solid prints from a lot of different companies. And, and they've really reached out and expanded. But still they've stayed within their within the wheelhouse they're they're slowly expanding they're, they're being careful with it i think one of the most brilliant things they did is the ultraman series that's 
that I think can pay off dividends like really well. And if anybody has been wondering if the Ultraman series that Mill Creek are putting are worth getting, I definitely recommend that uh, those uh, as well. Now, I do have to let you know, if you are a Kaiju fan or you're an Ultraman fan and you've never watched the early Ultraman stuff before, uh, that Ultra Q, the original series, doesn't actually have Ultraman in it. It was never meant to have Ultraman in it. Uh, it was uh, more of a almost an anthology-esque type, like Twilight Zone style of, uh, of Kaiju series that had like uh, ongoing characters. It was the next series that started the whole Ultraman mythos. Ultra Q is different, but I think it's really worth owning. A lot of people get those mixed up. I, I still have just have my original guns, you know, guns, girls, and G strings uh, set, but I really want to upgrade them down the road. My dad had some bad luck with a couple of Mill Creek releases. He got uh, new kids, and his copy new kids uh, didn't work. Uh, and he got an any that also didn't work. It just like froze. Ronin. Ro Arrow put out a good edition of Ronin, actually. I got to pick that up down the road. Or is that what you're mentioning? And I just missed this. <clears throat> yeah, my yeah, my I got it from my dad actually, right, man. Uh, my dad's not as much a collector now as he used to be, <clears throat> because he's gotten a lot of stuff that he wanted, and he kind of like kind of weeded down till it was just all stuff that he wanted. They do, and you get to see some uh, s some sneak previews and stuff like the Ultraman series on there. Uh, but uh, it wasn't for like people like my like people like my dad was a huge movie collector. He used to uh, read famous monsters of Filmland. That's how I got into uh, in, into that. Uh, my mom loved like uh, true crime and mystery mystery films, and that is actually one of the reasons I could, I could get slashers into my house. Uh, one of my aunts was a huge Hammer and Gothic horror fan. Um, and I was a I was a geeky little kid, that uh, that moved around a lot, so it meant making friends. So in between the time of trying to make friends, I would often find myself diving into movies and books. And uh, I became I became like a movie lover, and uh, and, a, and a lover of books, like everything from the Fletch series to uh, Down Pendleton's. Uh, you know the execution novels uh, to Agatha Christie to just like biographies and stuff like that and I did want to do uh, a book oriented video uh, I was going to do a horror book oriented video during the 31 days of live horror but I didn't get around to it and I did want to do like a book one down the road but I know not very many people are going to watch that <laughs> but I'll still make it anyway because I'll make it for you guys that watch all my stuff and I appreciate it De Niro. I love De Niro. I love... Do you remember Cape Fear? Like the remake of Cape Fear that's actually really good. Um, and we actually like Robert Mitchum actually show up like as a part in it. But uh, Robert De Niro was amazing in that film. And, and what I love about... I, I love audiobooks too. Uh, I just don't have the the time and space to to like listen to the, a lot of them. I used to listen to a lot of Doc True stuff, big Finnish audios. But uh, Mikey, Mikey. but I actually love the I, I like the fact the Cape Fear. Well, that's fear actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, I like the Cape Fear basically because uh, and it's kind of a remake, wasn't it? Nobody was good, like, not really, in Cape Fear. Uh, everybody was jaded or complex or different. It still kind of works. If you're, like, just ser seriously, go back, look at the, the Cape Fear, and then look at Fear, and there's, you know, there's definitely some, like, similarities. There's some cribbing from, uh, from those films. Yeah, but Fear is more along the, uh, the scary teenager aspect.
I was the type of uh, kid that basically, I used to have a lot of books and around all the time. And there were like uh, kids, like sometimes younger kids, sometimes older kids. But I I would be sitting usually on a, on a step outside. And this is an order like this. Maybe this was prophetic, actually. And people would, would come along. And uh, I would like read or I'd tell them stories. And I would do it like in like acting out the, doing the different voices and different characterizations and stuff like that. So it became like a kind of a hangout thing where once a week there'd be people that would, would come around when I was younger and I would uh, I'd either read something from a book or I'd, uh, or I'd tell a story that, I, that I'd heard in a book or I'd just make it one up uh, because I wrote uh, in, my, in my spare time as a kid as well. And uh, it was like a, we do it usually around once a week. There'd be a bunch of us we'd get together and I'd, uh, and I'd read, I'd talk, and I'd, uh, I'd, and I'd tell stories. So, things haven't changed a lot, have they? You are so cleaning yourself. I'm so glad you're not on camera, kitty cat. <clears throat> Sci-Fi Book, The Monk Club. Oh, wow, I remember that. Did you have that? I used to see it in, like, in like magazines and stuff. I try not to read it anymore until... I, like, doc, I, want, I desperately want to read Doctor Sleep, but I don't want to read it before I see the film. And I've already seen... Like, somebody mentioned... I think it was Kathy mentioned I watched trailers. Uh, the first trailer for, for Doctor Sleep, I utterly loved... And then I saw the second trailer for Dr. Sleep and I got a bit disappointed. So I'm not watching any more trailers uh, from there. It's, I, I, I can't get a beat on like exactly what the film is. I thought I did in the first trailer, but in the second trailer, I'm like, what the hell is this? So we'll see. Uh, I hear it's got good reviews, hasn't it? Favorite high school English project was comparing Isaac Asimov's I Robe to Frank. Oh, the rules of robotics. <clears throat> one man band thing. What do you mean one man band thing? I'm actually kind of curious. Does it really? Uh, I'm going to read the book after I check out the film. Well, I'm a little bit older uh, for the Nick stuff, but uh, yes, I do. I'm... Um, I'm a, I've always been a big kid. I've l I loved Are You Afraid of the Dark? That's the Canadian like kind of goosebumps type thing. And if you wanted to get like, if you wanted your goosebumps, if you wanted like more more depressing and downbeat. There was a show that came out afterwards called The Haunting Hour, which was an R.L. Stein show last for a couple seasons, at least a couple seasons. And whereas Goosebumps, you pretty much everything worked out in the end. Haunting Hour, not so much. Uh, <laughs> if you've never watched it, definitely check it out because it rarely has a happy happy ending. It is the outer limits of the young kid uh, like horror anthology series it tends to get like like everybody remembers Are You Afraid of the Dark everybody remembers Goosebumps very few people remember The Haunting Hour or oh, dude I have such like serious respect for that my, my dad what the heck my dad is a is a was a, was a musician for years. He played in all these in lots of different bands. He can do any instrument. Like he can sing. I can't carry a tune. Uh, I can't. I, I you know I, I don't play any instruments. I played like a little bit of keyboard, and by that little bit, I had a guitar, and I was not the best, to put it uh, politely. Which I think uh, probably uh, disappointed my dad a bit actually. <laughs> Heavy metal, you were in heavy metal bands, so you were like a ladies. You you got the ladies then. I, I'm going to assume, you got the ladies. I can do a great lip sync. Does that count? Uh, 
That is so cool. See, here you sound like a pro. Right? Uh, I was the I was the writer actor, and that's not exactly the uh, the lady killer thing that uh, picking up and uh, playing a guitar or an instrument is. But uh, I only was, I did one night in one band and I was a singer. I was a punk band. And I don't even remember the name of it right now, but basically the lead singer had drank so much that he, he couldn't sing. And he said, you know, just go out. You know, the music's going to be really loud. They're going to shout, you're, you know, you can shout it. Uh, they're not going to notice. And it was true, actually. But uh, what music do I like? To, I like everything. Uh, I'm not so big on like. I'm not a big country person, to be completely honest with you. Uh, definitely, let me know. <laughs> uh, I was big into punk. Uh, I liked. Uh, I liked pop music. I grew up in the '80s. Uh, I liked rock. I liked hard rock. I liked metal. I didn't like death metal. I never got into death metal, uh, and I never got into that really like the darker stuff. Uh, but. Uh, you're country western. I I do see it as country western person. The only country western I know is uh, well, Johnny Cash. Do, really? Uh, I can't, man. I can't. I, I can see that just by your name. I would I would have said that. Like, uh, but uh, I I can't. Like, I got a I got a friend. I love classical music. Classical music, opera. I like opera. Uh, I do like Hank Williams. Not everything. Uh, Hank Williams more than Hank Williams Jr. But I will listen to everything. I like musicals. Uh, I I can listen to like the, the newer stuff. Willie Nelson, yeah. Uh, not everything again, but I do like some of them. My rifle, my pony, me. I do not know what that is. But uh, I do know some of the. I guess I guess more popular stuff or the, or you know when there's like the country pop kind of fusion. I love the movie opera. It's fantastic. Holly underrated or gentle film. My favorite, Goblin, Claudio Minetti, stands out, Ina Morricone, a lot of the Italian ones. Uh, I like Danny Elfman. Not a composer, but I do like uh, Juice Newton. Had a crush on her, actually. And Laura Branigan was one of my favorites, too. For a certain one, do you have a big question? Okay, I'm ready for the big question. I like ZZ Top a lot, actually. I think they're underrated. Oh, Kiss, of course. Uh, Love's been a little bit hard on me. One of my favorites. I listen to it a lot. Uh, but also, the one of my more, my, I guess, more slightly more modern songs is I am a Mariana Trench fan. And uh, Celebrity Status and, uh, and Cross My Heart are two of my favorites that I listen to on a regular basis. All right. That is a really good question, Northern Lights. And I definitely will do a video on that. And Daza, let's we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Well, don't worry, my guy actually got a dip it's in too. And I'm the person. <laughs> Hillary Swank. Really? Uh, I like Hillary Swank. Uh, she's Johnny Cash. I used to sing uh, Folsom, what was it? Uh, Fol Folsom Prison, whatever it was called. <laughs> but my favorite Johnny Cash was uh, Jackson with uh, what they did with you and Carter. And when I was in early in college, I think it was, I uh, there was this uh, this girl in it. We weren't like really dating or anything. We're just it was casual, but we 
sometimes I'd I'd be kind of like I'd come in I'd be down or I'd be kind of like uh maybe a little maybe I drank a little too much the night before because it was college uh but uh she'd see me in in the hallway and I'd look over at her and we would randomly start singing something and we would catch on to each other like immediately and I don't know how many times we sang like Jackson the girl is mine uh, I actually did my cousin did actually sang the girl is mine um or just like tap danced a bit down the hall because I did that because <laughs> I'm weird I have to admit I don't know as much about ballet as I as I wish I did uh, obviously I'm from the 80s so I know all about uh, Brishnikov and uh, and people like that uh, but uh I, I do I do need to like learn more I was in the I was in the tap a bit I'm from Newfoundland so we do this kind of dance here that's called a jig and it is similar in style to kind of a, like a tap style dance and my uh, my grandfather was the uh, was the best uh, I'm not even joking um, at that uh, in the whole like area that I was in like and like in our whole like in that whole set side of my province he was he was known for for his abilities when it came to dance and I dance very white I think And that's not even like a, a like a, a like a diss. Like I, I I do think I can dance okay. It's just that uh, it takes me a while to get into it. I need a few drinks because when I start out, like when I start out, when I honestly start out, it's the you know the whole heel to side of foot. I <laughs> suppose. I was about to build I was about to sell her. I was about to catch fish that brings her mom to Lizer. Yeah, I know all that stuff. <laughs> I found it hard. I like people here that are actually from uh Canada, does my Newfoundland accent come through to you? Because for a long time I I found it hard to try and get get an accent. Uh, and I do think nowadays more often I I will like if I'm talking faster and stuff it it might come through but I lived in a lot of different areas which mixed up my accent a bit and I'm not gonna lie there was times when I was younger where that did become an issue where uh, I had people look at me and say you don't talk like us uh, like legit like when I was a kid in high school that that looked at me and said you you don't talk you, you don't talk like us and uh, I was it was it was hurtful uh, at, at some at points Do you have to go? <laughs> I drop the H's a lot. If you, that's like a Canadian thing. But there's a difference between a Canadian accent and like a Newfoundland accent. Uh, and there's different areas in Newfoundland that has, have different style of accents. I like the second part of the question. Remind me. I I wanted this. So yes, I will do a video on this uh, Northern Lights. You have no accent it's hard sometimes and sometimes accents slip uh, well I don't have a new no no Scotia accent I haven't been here long enough to get one of those uh, uh, they actually have a very different accent here uh, they're very uh, it's kind of I was, that I have the uh, it, it's it's take one used to like for instance there's like certain you live in Nova Scotia there's certain like a terminologies that I don't quite understand um, it's true like I, I would never hear my accent like in the past but uh, I, I do uh, I do have things that slip like uh, sometimes I know when I drop an H like, I know when I drop an H
And you know what I noticed too? Uh, just a little thing that I've noticed is that if you move away from your home and uh, <laughs> uh, the Californians, Saturday Night Live, uh, and uh, it, the more homesick you are, the more your, your accent comes that you probably didn't use when you're home. <laughs> from these uh. I actually am more like I uh, grew up like from uh, again Newfoundland and in Alberta and in uh, and in Ontario Meryl Streep is a genius when it comes to accents like across the board the greatest when it comes to accents And that's the thing, is that a lot of people, when they do do an accent, they, especially in acting, is that they pick up on the broadness of an accent. And they do like a broad, a New York, or a, you know, that type of thing, uh, which isn't a real accent. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's a character of an accent. But the genius of it, Meryl Streep, is that she just doesn't listen to the bass sound of like of, of what an accent basically could be. She she listens to the little inflections and things that are said, uh, and the way that they're said. So that uh, I do find, uh, like me personally, that uh, her when she's doing an accent, it seems more authentic. Like I've seen a lot of people do like over the top stuff. My better half, for instance, uh, she's she's from Morocco. She lived in uh, in South Carolina, and uh, can you imagine a, Mor a Moroccan with a South Carolina accent? Well, she had one that she picked up picked up for a while. Then she moved over to New York, and she uh, she went to uh, to University of New York for uh, five or six years, I think. And uh, then she went back to Morocco, and then she came to Canada. And uh, now, we're, and she went to Newfoundland, and now we are in uh, Nova Scotia. So you can imagine the mixture of accents that she's had over the years. Especially when she left uh, her uh, her hometown of Morocco, she knew no English, and she uh, she came to South Carolina where she learned English. And I will be completely honest; she knows it better than I do, uh, because you find that people that learn language uh, later in life, they appreciate and they understand the actual like la rules of language better than people that natively speak it, because we kind of just take it for. Your comments are being deleted? Where? The last comment before your comment being deleted was it was a was a California accent. Was was there one after that? I don't have anybody. Else. Nobody else has like a a thing on on here to in order to delete comments except for me and I and I'm and I'm obviously not doing it. Uh, here I see the here thing. Unless it's a YouTube type thing, I, I am sort of. No. I try going in and coming back out, going out and coming back in again, Kathy. Hopefully, that that fixes it for you. Um. I am. I. I was, I was married before, and I have been with my uh, the present girl that I'm with now for years, uh, years, many years. Uh, we had commitment ceremonies. Uh, we had two of them. We had one in Morocco, and uh, that was a two-day one. And we had a uh, another one-day ceremony here in uh, in uh, well, not here in Newfoundland. Exactly, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and uh, the, and we are actually getting legally hitched this year. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Do well, they really? I get like messages on here, but auto delete comments is wrong, man. They should not do that. Thank you, Doc. So yeah, we uh, we actually talked about it. So I I guess I have or it's my second marriage. I guess I'll be, uh, you know, I gotta pay some money because I don't remember where my divorce decree is at right now. So I'll have to look into getting that uh, because that's you know before you get remarried, you have to prove that you that you got divorced. 
and that was a few years ago, and I've moved since then, so I'm probably going to go to the courts and just uh, get them to reissue it. It's going to cost a bit of money. Ouch. Yeah. On hopefully, if everything is okay, Danuch, on the 18th of November. So another 12 days, and I, and at this point, I am feeling it. I am really feeling it. The first week or so was it was cool, and we did we talk, and last day or two, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie. I got uh, I've been down. I got uh, I got I got like. I don't know a lot of people here, like I know people to see people, but I don't don't I don't you know know people like to go and like, go and have coffee or go we'll watch a movie or anything like that. Uh, my better half is my best friend. I'm not sure what's going on, Kathy. Uh, I apologize, and I, but you should not be getting things deleted. Usually if something is like before it goes into any type of status, uh, <clears throat> then you'll see like, uh, then I'll get a message here like uh, to show. I'm trying to see if anything shows here. No, nothing's showing. That's weird. <clears throat> it's not showing you as, being, as having deleted, but maybe it's because I'm not seeing those messages. Got the California sex message. I, I disagree. I would love to go to California. You follow my Facebook page. I apologize for when it gets political. Uh, no, no. If there's a troll, I don't think they would. They'd be. They'd have the ability to do that. To be honest with you. Uh, hey, Pingo, welcome. Yes, I, I do like the Christopher Walken dancing video. It seems like whatever it is, it's like, it's something, there's maybe some type of like, what's the word I'm looking for? Algorithm that, that might be picking up something and, and, and mistaking it for something else. I try to keep my Facebook page fairly fairly fun. So, yeah. Uh, oh, also, if you ever like, if if anybody's ever like friended me on like on a social media that, and and I haven't friended you you back yet, uh, especially if it's a Facebook or something, like that, just like please send me a message and say, hey, this is me, uh, because there's so many like hacks on Facebook and stuff like that. Uh, That uh, I, that I, I do, uh, you I do like friend everybody. Confederate, you should be saying. Well, you just said Confederacy. Okay, what's this? Uh, looking to get out of print Sinbad and I have the Demon limited editions from Indicator. So, do you have like ones that you're looking at, Pinga? Like Sinbad's gonna be a harder get for a decent for a cheaper price, uh, than uh, than it would have been before. You still might should be getting Night of the Demon for a fairly decent, for a fairly decent price, but if you can get them for uh, so what roundabout? What's the roundabout like range you're seeing them at? Obviously, you don't want to pay like four or five hundred dollars, something like that. <laughs> Red heck. <laughs> oh wow. One hundred twenty-five. That's not bad actually. For Simba, that, that's actually a decent price. I do see an uh, delay. The Simba one, I think it's worth it. Uh, do you want me to get to show you the Simba one? I'll, I'll get mine. I'm able to help you decide. I Simba was the first indicator box set that I ever picked up, and uh, just to let you know, um, I. Uh, I got it at a really good price at the time, but and it was my better half that chose it. She's the one that got me in the indicator. In 
it seems like I'm wearing a similar outfit in the last couple of videos, that's because this, these are my casu casual PJs that I uh, wear uh, when I'm just home relaxing. So I haven't dressed up in the last couple of days because I've been in a funk of mood. <laughs> All right, so this is the Sinbad sin sin This is a Sinbad set. Uh, they're all numbered like this with this of course and in it you get an incredible book about Ray Harryhausen which has amazing pictures one of the most interesting things about this book is there was a fourth Sinbad movie that was not made but it was kind of in production to be made and it was called Sinbad Goes to Mars and you find all out uh, all you want to know about Sinbad Goes to Mars right here in this book and there is a ton there's a plethora of special features uh, this is the Sinbad and uh, the Tiger I'll tell you so for Sinbad and, uh, and the Tiger there aside from there's a 2k restoration original manual audio uh, alternative 5.1 surround soundtrack an 85 minute interview BFI interview with Ray Harryhausen which is incredible uh, 12 minute interview with uh, Jane Seymour uh, there's a 58 minute interview called the Harryhausen Chronicles with uh, oh there's a documentary called the Harryhausen Chronicles there's a 12 minute interview with John Landis uh, the Harryhausen Chronicles is Larry Leonard, blah, narrated by Leonard Nimoy sorry about that isolated score on here as well and of course the image galleries and uh, this one here, the Golden Voyage, the same matter, which is often considered the best of them. We have the alternate soundtrack again. There's a, the John Player lecture. I love the lectures, which is a 90 minute uh, like archival auto recording of uh, Harryhausen, Golden Times, Time Travels with Tom Baker. It was a 37 minute interview. There's a 15 minute interview with Caroline Monroe, a 25 minute Harry Hag Harryhausen Legacy. There's a Super 8 version. Of, uh, of the film here done in four installments and of course there is the uh, isolated soundtrack and next up is the seventh voyage Sinbad which has a ton of features again uh, auto commentary with Ray Harris and visual effects experts Phil Tippett and Randall William Cook and author Stephen Smith and producer Arnold Cooner the secret of Sinbad 11 minutes interview this is Dy Dynamation which is a four minute one uh, a look behind the voyage 12 minutes uh, there's a Super 8 versions before installments. Sinbad may have been good, may have been bad, but it's been good to me. Three minute promotional tie in song. Uh, the music of Bernard Herman, a 27 minute tribute. Uh, isolated score, uh, Phil Tippett's birthday message. A, uh, and there's uh, the uh, Trailers from Hell, Brian Trenchard Smith. So I think it's a pretty good package. And it is well put together. It is a hard box. I like the other two. Uh, you know, obviously the least effects wise is gonna be uh, is gonna be Sinbad in the Eye of the Tiger, but I really enjoyed that one. Uh, oh, Daz, what well, do you, this is your video, Daz. Uh, so everybody here can thank Daz for this video happening tonight because without Daz, Daz's generosity and bringing in the perversion story, we wouldn't have had this almost 100 minute long video. And Danuch, we have one coming up with your name on it too, don't we? <laughs> uh, Daz, you rocked it. And thank you so much. I always keep these things, by the way. I definitely will. Thank you. Let, definitely let me know. All right, and with that being said, at 99 minutes, almost the 100 minute mark, I work early tomorrow. But when somebody sends me something, I make a video specifically, you know, donated from with, with their name on it. And uh, I try to, uh, as a man of my word, it is time for tea. I'm losing my voice. I am Aaron. This is my movie library. You guys are the movie club. You guys rock. You guys are awesome. Um, again, thank you, Daz, for the donation to the movie library. It's a movie that I've wanted for a very long time. 
have a wonderful night guys and i will see you later because right now it seriously is time for tea i think my kitty's falling asleep over there